So what do we have? We have Paul writing about 50s AD, talking about events that have occurred that he claims to have occurred 20 years earlier. And then about 20 years after that, we have the Gospel of Mark, and then all, all other Gospels spin off of that. In fact, they're all built off top of, top of Mark. Even from their internal details and chronology alone, the letters as written only fit two periods of history, the 50s AD and the 50s BC. Balance of probability puts them in the 50s AD. There is inadequate evidence to argue for any other date than the 50s AD. The Epistle of Barnabas, which assumes the historicity of Jesus, could conceivably date around this same time, but it has not been any more precisely dated than 70 to 130 CE, and in my opinion, it surely dates to the period 130 to 132 CE. Hello, and welcome to this Notory production. This presentation will contest the position of Dr. Richard Carrier that the 50s Common Era is the start point of Christianity and present the case for multiple Christologies existing across the Eastern Mediterranean as early as the second half of the first century BCE. It is also worth pointing out as a grounding for the information to follow that, contrary to Dr. Carrier's opening statement in this video, Paul does not make any claims about when he considers the death of his Jesus character to have taken place, nor for that matter do the authors of the Epistle of Barnabas and the First Epistle of Clement. In fact, it is only the post-70 Common Era Gospel stories that give a specific historical time frame for the crucifixion scene of their Jesus character. And this, as we shall see, demonstrates that the specific Jesus of the post-70 Common Era Gospels is wholly plagiarised fiction constructed from earlier, now eradicated Christologies. This content without the need of any arbitrary mathematical functions and concentrating solely on the text present in the extant documents, in line with other known secular historical data of the time frame concerned, confirms the fictional nature of the post-70 Common Era Gospel Jesus story and forms one part of my own personal overall exposition on the Jesus myth. This along with presentations on how and why I perceive the post-70 Gospel version of a Jesus to have been created can all be found in my non-peer-reviewed book, 70. If you would be interested in exploring my overall take on the Gospel Jesus myth, links for the book can be found in the pinned comment below this video. For this particular video, I will review the content of three extant documents to present the case for multiple Christologies existing pre-Common Era. And the first document, the Epistle of Barnabas, can be found here in the British Library. The oldest extant copy of the Epistle of Barnabas is a full copy located in the 4th century Codex Sinaiticus, which was discovered in 1859 by Constantine von Tischendorf. Tischendorf published the contents of the Codex for open scholarly review in 1862. Joseph Michael Heer gave a review of a full Latin text of the epistle in 1908. The traditional consensus and deeply Christian biased dating of the epistle is for a range between 70 and 132 common era. The reasoning behind this date range is the epistle mentions a temple destruction, which creates the unfounded assertion that this must therefore be a reference to the destruction occurring after the accepted date for the crucifixion of the Gospel Jesus character, since the epistle also references the resurrection of a Jesus. This is unfounded because it asserts, without evidence, that there was only ever one Jesus theology. We know from the letters of Paul that that is an incorrect declaration. The destruction reference is therefore allocated by late 19th and early 20th century scholarship to the destruction in 70 Common Era by Titus, leading to the untenable statement that the epistle was written post-70 Common Era. 
The epistle is referenced in a small way by Clement of Alexandria. Clement of Alexandria died circa 215, leading to the correct proposition that the epistle existed before 215. The epistle speaks of an existing and hopeful Jewish community. Such a community would not exist following the complete annihilation of Jewish culture by Hadrian after the Romans crushed the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135. This adjusts the proposed latest possible date to the start of the Bar Kokhba revolt in 132, resulting in the current 70 to 132 date range. The first circumstance to highlight is that, while the existence of an epistle from a supposed Barnabas was known to us from the content of the 3rd and 4th century writings of Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Didymus, Jerome and Eusebius of Caesarea, who condemned the epistle as disputed, its exact contents were not known to us prior to the late 19th century. The theological academia did not have access to the full content of the epistle prior to the publications by Tischendorf and here. This informs us that the dating of the epistle is produced by the 19th century deeply religious theological university alumni. It is therefore a proposed dating loaded with a strong Christian based bias in its conclusions and a dating which is therefore in serious need of modern secular interrogation. The main thrust of the epistle is to inform Christians that the Jewish community, both past and present, who are faithful to the law, misunderstood their own scripture. The author explains that they read it as literal, while it is in fact all allegory that gives cryptic messages to the crucifixion of Christ to come, an event which, according to the author, has already occurred in the past. The author also constantly urges his audience to stay faithful to the belief in the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ, since the events indicating the impending end times have now begun and Christ's return to usher in the eschaton and judge all humans is imminent. This, he believes, is indicated by what he refers to on several occasions as the present situation we find ourselves in. There are many English-based translations of the epistle, and around a particular section of the epistle, chapter 16, regarding the temple, they all give a similar, if slightly varied, rendition. They are all late 19th and early 20th century, Christian-centric in origin. All of the translations agree on several points for chapter 16, being that there was a war, followed by a temple destruction and a new temple is being built. But this activity is folly since, in the view of the author, the destruction signals that the dawn of the eschaton has arrived. Using the oldest known Greek copy from the Codex Sinaiticus, which can be extracted in its original Greek from the Codex Sinaiticus website, and the use of modern translation software, followed by correspondence with a group of theology mythology enthusiasts from Greece for review, for whom Greek is their native language, I have constructed my own translation of chapter 16 verses 3 to 5. Of these passages the Lord says, Those who demolish this temple, they will build it. Because of their war it was demolished by the enemies, now they and the enemies rebuild it. Again, in the future, the surrender of the city and the people and the temple of Israel has been revealed in Scripture. And it is at the end of the days that the Lord will deliver up the sheep of the fodder and the pasture and their tower to destruction to be made as the Lord spoke. The salient points to note here are The author speaks of a war of some description, but does not indicate that the war resulted in the total destruction of anything but the temple. He certainly does not indicate a comprehensive genocide of the Jewish people, followed by the complete raising to the ground of the entire city. We can deduce this because the remainder of the epistle is aimed at the folly of the Jews in rebuilding their temple. He therefore only implies the surrender of the people and the city to their enemy with the subsequent destruction 
and rebuild of the temple. At some unspecified time the temple was demolished, not necessarily during the war or as the culmination of the war, but the demolition would appear to be linked in some way with the politics of the recent war. A temple is being rebuilt at the time of writing. A city, Jewish people and the temple being rebuilt also exist at the time of writing, given that the author explains to them that God has initiated the end of days. To be informed as such, they need by necessity to exist in the author's present. To date this epistle with the due diligence it deserves, void of centuries of Christian duress and bias, we need to look for all known occurrences in history of a temple building period in Jerusalem which was preceded by a temple demolition which was itself preceded by a war which is somehow politically linked to the demolition activity. There aren't too many options. We have the first Jewish revolt with Titus's destruction of the second temple in 70 Comanera and Hadrian's construction of a temple to Jupiter circa 130. Herod's war with the Hasmoneans and Herod's second temple demolition and rebuild in 19 BCE. The Jewish war with Nebuchadnezzar resulting in Nebuchadnezzar's first temple destruction in 586 BCE and the second temple construction circa 516 BCE. The author confirms in the text that he is writing during a temple building process. Since the above three scenarios cover all temple destruction stroke demolition and temple rebuild events, he is therefore referencing one and only one of these three temple build activities. He is therefore writing either circa 130 common era, 19 BCE or 516 BCE. There are no other periods from history that can be aligned with the statements made by the author in chapter 16. Given the serious implications of this data to the whole Christian movement, we must then accept that the current consensus allocation of the temple demolition to the 70 common era demolition of Titus from 19th stroke 20th century Christian apologists is clearly from necessity. It is not from unbiased sound scholarship. We will now consider each option in turn to ascertain their fit with the text in the epistle, starting with the 70 common era destruction of the second temple being paired with Hadrian's 130 common era building of a temple to Jupiter. There are six strong reasons why this dating is not possible. One, who is the temple for? We need to tackle and confirm the concept that the author's notion of the temple which is being built stroke rebuilt is a Jewish temple to Yahweh rather than a temple to any other culture's god or gods. In the opening to chapter 16, the author clearly distinguishes between a temple to Yahweh and a temple to what he would have considered a pagan god. He writes, We come now to the matter of the temple, and I will show you how mistaken these miserable folk were in pinning their hopes to the building itself, as if that were the home of God instead of to God their own creator. Indeed, they were scarcely less misguided than the heathen in the way they ascribed divine holiness to their temple. After 16.5, in which the author presents the prophecy that the city and Jewish people are all to be delivered up at the Eschaton, he then writes, Can there be any such thing as a temple to God at all? To be sure there can, but where God himself tells us that he is building it and perfecting it. The author progresses to explain that this is a temple of the flesh, a temple to God in the heart. He compares the validity of his own temple of the flesh to God with the folly of the building of a brick temple to God. He does not explicitly differentiate the noun God in this section with regard to the brick temple being built and his own concept of a spiritual temple. Recall the manner in which he does explicitly do this in the opening paragraph of the chapter when explaining the folly of a brick temple to God 
comparing it to the folly of pagan temples to pagan gods. So we can be confident that the temple described as being rebuilt at the time of writing, as far as the author is concerned, is a Jewish temple to the Jewish God. It is not a Roman temple to Jupiter. His very reasoning in his argument is, our God does not want a brick temple. He wants us to be his temple. For the chronological timing regarding the construction of a Roman temple to Jupiter at the start of the Simon Bar Kokhba revolt, we can turn to Cassius Dio. Cassius Dio, History of Rome, Book 69. In Jerusalem, he founded a city in place of the one raised to the ground, naming it Elia Capitolina, and on the site of the temple of the god he raised a new temple to Jupiter. This brought on a war that was not slight nor of brief duration, for the Jews deemed it intolerable that foreign races should be settled in their city and foreign religious rites be planted there. So it seems, according to Cassius Dio, the pagan temple to Jupiter was built, or at least started, before the start of the war, and it was the very catalyst for the revolt. This would also confirm that, if the Epistle of Barnabas were to be referencing this temple build, it would be written during times of severe Roman-Jewish tensions, just before or during the war. Moreover, the author would know for certain it was a pagan temple, since it was this knowledge that sparked the conflict. But in the Epistle, the author clearly describes a Jewish temple being built to the Jewish God. 2. Where is the post-70 Common Era Gospel content? The epistle is completely void of the contents of the Jesus story contained in all four Gospels and Acts. If it were dated so late, some 50 years after the publication of the Gospels and Acts, this would not be the case. Given the raison d'etre for the epistle itself, at the very least the author would have referenced the Sermon on the Mount from the Gospel of Matthew, or knowledge of the folklore that made this supposed event a written source, and in doing so, taking such an opportunity to quote direct from Jesus himself, rather than exclusively referencing Old Testament scripture to make his points. A more direct example is found at the start of chapter 6. Here the author informs us what Jesus said when the deed of crucifixion had been completed. When he does, he quotes directly from Isaiah rather from the reports of the four Gospels regarding Jesus' last words. The most telling missing Gospel content is in, or not as it were, chapter 16 itself. If the author is writing circa 130 to 132, and therefore referencing the 70 Common Era destruction by Titus, how does he not include Mark 13.1 to 2, Matthew 24.1 to 2, or Luke 21.5 to 6 in this section? Gospel content, which is also a reverse prophecy construction by the Gospel authors referencing the 70 Common Era destruction. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. For such a late dating for the Epistle of Barnabas, with the supposed destruction being considered to be the destruction of Titus, we would expect chapter 16.5 in the Epistle to be something along the lines of, Again, in the future, the surrender of the city and the people and the temple of Israel has been revealed in Scripture. And it is at the end of the days that the Lord will deliver up the sheep of the fodder and the pasture and their tower to destruction. The Beloved also made his disciples aware of this fate when he said, Do you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. And it happened as the Lord spoke. So it would appear that the author of the Epistle of Barnabas is writing pre-Gospels, pre-70s, and could not therefore be referencing the 70 Common Era destruction. 3. Which version of a Jesus is being preached? The author would seem to be preaching a different version of Jesus to the one depicted in Acts. His Jesus did resurrect on a Sunday, the eighth day, but on this he writes, 
And we too rejoice in celebrating the eighth day because that was when Jesus rose from the dead and showed himself again and ascended into heaven. All three events happening at the same time, or at least on the same day. No 40-day sabbatical with the apostles before departing to sit at the right hand of God in the kingdom of heaven. For a comparison with Paul and the Gospels, there are differences of a more substantial nature. In chapter 12, the author identifies Joshua as Jesus manifest in the flesh by God, and that Christ is not from the line of David, this coming as a statement from David himself. To announce that Jesus is not a descendant of David is contrary to the text of Paul and contrary to the genealogies in Matthew and Luke. 4. Is there an existing city? The author is referring explicitly and directly to a city that exists, populated by people devoted to the Jewish God and to people who worship a Jesus, at a time when the building of a temple to the Jewish God is taking place. We know from the text of Josephus on the outcome of the first Jewish revolt, and from the text of Cassius Dio on the Simon Karpopov revolt, that post-70 common era, through to the building of Hadrian's Roman city over the ruins of Jerusalem, no such community existed with which to reference and discuss these issues, or to build a temple. Now, as soon as the army had no more people to slay or to plunder, because there remained none to be objects of their fury, for they would have not spared any had there remained any other such work to be done, Caesar gave orders that they should now demolish the entire city and temple. It was so thoroughly laid even with the ground by those that dug it up by the foundations that there was left nothing to make those that came thither believe it had ever been inhabited. Cassius Dio, History of Rome, Book 69.12-14 By taking them in separate groups by means of the numbers of his soldiers and his under-officers and by depriving them of food, and shutting them up as he was able, rather slowly to be sure, but with comparative little danger, to crush and exhaust and exterminate them. Very few of them survived. Fifty of their most important garrisons, and 985 of their most renowned towns, were blotted out. Fifty-eight myriads of men were slaughtered in the course of the invasions and battles, and the number of those that perished by famine and disease and fire were past all investigating, Thus nearly the whole of Judea was made desolate. 5. Chronology of Events For the epistle to have been written in any period, we need to connect four events in a specifically stated chronological order. We need a war, followed by a temple destruction, followed by a temple rebuild, followed by the author declaring to his audience that the eschaton has started. In the period leading up to the Bar Kokhba revolt, we might have the building of a pagan temple, but we have no recent war and no temple destruction as the result of a war that has not yet occurred. For the period during the Bar Kokhba revolt, we would have a war and might have a temple build, but no temple destruction. And for the period after the war, there was a war and a temple build, but there is again no temple destruction, but more importantly, there would now be no Jewish or Christian community in the city to refer the epistle to. The chronology of events in the epistle, set against the chronology of events for the Bar Kokhba revolt, reveals that the letter is not written just before, during or after the Bar Kokhba revolt. 6. Which destruction is the author referencing? Since we need a temple destruction followed by a temple rebuild, the epistle cannot be referenced in the 70 common era destruction, for which there has never been a rebuild of the Jewish temple. And the author is quite clear on this, he is referring to a rebuild of a Jewish temple to Yahweh. Also, as a result of the 66-73 war, post-70 there was no city of Jerusalem, never mind a temple. These six arguments collectively demonstrate that the author is not referencing the 70 common era destruction of the temple by Titus 
coupled with the building of Hadrian's Temple to Jupiter in 130. But surely we can all see why, from the view of the Christian scholars, it would be falsely promoted as such, and I would add knowingly falsely promoted as such. To correctly conclude and publicly report that the epistle is not referencing Titus's destruction would be to also declare that the epistle is referencing the demolition and rebuild of the temple by Herod the Great in 19 BCE at the latest, with the unavoidable conclusion that the Jesus in the Gospels can then only be pure plagiarised fiction. No Christian bias scholar from history would have done this, and none today do. Now we evaluate the circa 19 BCE dating. To evaluate a fit with chapter 16 of the epistle to the events around Herod's kingship of Judea, we can again turn to the works of Josephus. Herod was awarded the kingship of Judea in 40 BCE by the Roman Senate on the recommendations of Mark Antony after Herod had fled Masada to Rome following the conquest of Jerusalem by the Parthians. But to realise this position, he first had to take Judea from the Hasmonean military by force. Herod assisted the Romans in their war with the Parthians, whom the Hasmonean king Antigonus II of Judea supported, being a puppet king of the Parthians. Herod defeated Antigonus as a result of the siege of Jerusalem in 36 BCE, and took his kingship up in Judea four years after being awarded the post by the Roman elite. Judea now had an Idumean king, rather than a Jewish Hasmonean king. Seventeen years later, as a political act, Herod demolishes and rebuilds the temple. This gives us a war with no citywide destruction or total slaughter of the Jewish population, and a temple destruction followed by a temple rebuild based on the politics of the recent war. It also gives us two groups, the Roman-backed Herodians, Idumeans, and the existing defeated Hasmonean supporters, Judeans, both of whom would comprise the labour force demolishing and rebuilding the temple. This all fits the references in the Epistle of Barnabas precisely. We can see these events recorded by Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews. Antiquities, chapter 14, paragraph 14, 4 to 5. So a senate was convocated, and Messala first, and then Atratinus, introduced Herod into it, and enlarged upon the benefits they had received from his father, and put them in mind of the goodwill he had borne to the Romans. At the same time, they accused Antigonus, and declared him an enemy, not only because of his former opposition to them, but that he had now overlooked the Romans, and taken the government from the Parthians. Upon this the Senate was irritated, and Antony informed them farther, that it was for their advantage in the Parthian war that Herod should be king. This seemed good to all the senators, and so they made a decree accordingly. And thus did this man, Herod, receive the kingdom, Judea. Antiquities 14.16 Sosius came with a great number of horsemen and footmen. The king, Herod, also came himself from Samaria, and brought with him no small army, besides that which was there before, for they were about thirty thousand, and they all met together at the walls of Jerusalem, being now an army of eleven legions, armed men on foot, and six thousand horsemen, with other auxiliaries out of Syria. The generals were two, Sosius, sent by Antony to assist Herod, and Herod on his own account in order to take the government from Antigonus, who was declared an enemy to Rome, and that he, Herod, might himself be king, according to the decree of the Senate. And now Herod having overcome his enemies, his care was to govern those foreigners who had been his assistants. Out of Herod's fear of this, a counter claim to the Roman Senate by Antigonus, it was that he, by giving Antony a great deal of money, endeavoured to persuade him, Antony, to have Antigonus slain, which, if it were once done, he should be free from that fear. And thus did the government of the Hasmonean cease, 126 years after it was first set up. Antiquities 15.11.1 And now Herod, 
in the 18th year of his reign, undertook a very great work, to build of himself the temple of God, and to make it larger in compass, and to raise it to a most magnificent altitude. The priests were afraid that he would pull down the whole edifice, and not be able to bring his intentions to perfection for its rebuilding, and this danger appeared to them to be very great, and the vastness of the undertaking to be such as could hardly be accomplished. Herod encouraged the priests, and told them that he would not pull down their temple until all things were gotten ready for building it up entirely again. So Herod took away the old foundations, and laid others, and erected the temple upon them, being in length 100 cubits, and in height 20 additional cubits. We can pray see these reports from Josephus in line with the epistle as Of these passages the Lord says, Those, Hasmoneans and Herodians, who demolish this temple, they, Hasmoneans and Herodians, will build it. Because of their, Hasmoneans, war, it was demolished by the enemies, Herod, the Roman-backed Idumean. Now they, the Hasmoneans, and the enemies, Roman-backed Herodians, rebuild it. Unlike the proposition of the circa 132 common era dating, which does not fit the text of the epistle at all, we can see that the 19 BCE dating fits the text exactly. Also, I would forward that the defeat and execution of the last Hasmonean king, followed by the temple demolition ordered by the new foreign Roman-backed king, would be the events that the author views as the signs that the end times have started, and the events behind such statements as in the present situation that we find ourselves in. Lastly, we now review the circa 516 BCE dating. The time span involved in the concept of there being a version of a Jesus worshipped as at 19 BCE to the traditional date for the modern version of a Jesus being active and crucified at 30 common era is a mere 49 years. That is not such a substantial shift in time to contemplate a theological genre existing and being morphed into different versions. The shift in time from the construction of the second temple in circa 516 BCE is a huge 546 years. Such a gap would seem to be too large to contemplate. But we have to remember that the victors, being the post-325 Common Era Catholic Church, not only wrote our theological history, they also brutally controlled the narrative. And this they did from post-325 through to the mid-1600s, burning books and people to eradicate all traces of alternative Jesus narratives that came to their attention. It is also noteworthy that, despite the time shift, there is actually no content in the Epistle of Barnabas that does exclude the Epistle from being written so early. Two items are noteworthy though. The Epistle draws its Old Testament examples from the Greek Septuagint rather than the Hebrew Tanakh. The Septuagint did not exist until the early 3rd century BCE, long after the circa 516 BCE construction of the Second Temple. However, the oldest copy of the epistle we have is from the 4th century Common Era, some 700 years after the creation of the Septuagint. If the original epistle was written circa 516 BCE, there is plenty of time in the 700 year gap between the creation of the Septuagint and the creation of the oldest extant 4th century copy of the epistle for the content of the epistle to have been updated from its use of Old Testament examples for a Greek reading audience who are more familiar with the Greek Septuagint than the Hebrew Tanakh. The second noteworthy objection would be that the epistle quotes from the book of Daniel, which is believed to have been compiled circa 2nd century BCE, again too late for a circa 516 BCE date for the epistle. Here though, we need to be mindful that the book of Daniel existed in sections before its compilation, and the version we have today is a compilation from multiple authors from differing decades, and possibly differing centuries. The quotes used in the Epistle of Barnabas come from chapter 7, being 7.24 and 7.7. .7. Chapter 7 belongs to a nest of chapters from 2 through to 7, where chapters 2, 3 and 4 
lead into a nested story and chapters 5, 6 and 7 lead out of the story. We can see that 2 pairs up with 7, 3 pairs up with 6 and 4 pairs up with 5. To explain this nesting concept, in chapter 2 the king has a dream and asks his soothsayers to tell him what the dream was and then give the interpretation of the dream. This is paralleled in chapter 7 with Daniel having a dream where he reveals and then explains the dream. In chapter 3, the king, Nebuchadnezzar, creates a gold statue of himself and orders that everyone must worship it. The penalty for not doing so is death in a furnace. Daniel's three friends do not worship the statue and are thrown into the furnace. They walk around inside the furnace and then are released from the furnace unharmed. For the parallel in chapter 6, the king, Darius, issues orders that no man may ask anything from any god via prayer. They may only request divine guidance from the king himself. The penalty for disobedience is death. Daniel is discovered praying to the Jewish god. He is therefore thrown into a pit of lions. Daniel emerges from the pit the following day, having not been touched by the lions. For chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar is sentenced by the supreme god to live in the wilderness as an animal for seven years until he admits that it is God, not an earthly king, that controls the destiny of all humankind. This Nebuchadnezzar does and regains his kingdom as a reward. The situation is reversed in chapter 5 where his son, Belshazzar, disrespects the supreme god by allowing his banquet guests to eat and drink from the sacred utensils stolen from the Jewish temple by Nebuchadnezzar. A message of his pending fate is written on the walls of the hall by a vision of a human hand. Daniel interprets the message, informing the king that because he did not submit to the will of God as his father did after a seven-year ordeal, he will not be spared by God. The king lost his life on the same night. None of this content from chapter 2 to 7 the nested story form part of the content of the book of Daniel that produces the 2nd century BCE dating. The segment of the book of Daniel that gives it its proposed 2nd century BCE dating is found in a separate section, being chapters 8 through 10. These chapters seem to cite historical events as future prophecies correctly for the years 167 to 164 BCE but chapters 11 and 12 then display that the author does not know events past 164 BCE. It is therefore entirely possible that the chapter 7 content of the book of Daniel is much older than the chapter 8 through 12 content. Conclusion on the dating of the Epistle of Barnabas We know that the author is not referring to the destruction of 70 common era, given that there was no rebuild of the Jewish temple to Yahweh post-70 Common Era. So the author is referencing either the 516 BCE build of the second temple or the 19 BCE Herod demolition and rebuild. Intuition would seem to lead us to the 19 BCE date as opposed to the 516 BCE date for reasons of the time gap of some 546 years from the traditional date of a Jesus set against a mere 50 years for the 19 BCE date. In addition, there are only 17 years between the war and demolition for the 19 BCE event, meaning the same generation would be involved in the war and the demolition and subsequent reconstruction. With the 516 BCE dating, there is a 70 year gap minimum between the destruction and the rebuild, which is multi-generational. It would be a different generation building the temple to that of the generation who witnessed the destruction, but not impossible nonetheless. Which of the two dates is the correct date with regard to the validity of the current Jesus story is rather irrelevant since, regardless of outcome, it demonstrates the Gospel 30 Common Era Jesus character is a fictional construction for the following logic. If the rebuild is the 516 BCE rebuild, we have confirmation that a version of Jesus worship existed in 19 BCE, since it had existed since 516 BCE.
If it is the 19 BCE rebuild, we again have confirmation that a version of Jesus worship existed in 19 BCE. So in either scenario, a version of Jesus worship existed in the 1st century BCE. With a sound basis established for asserting the Gospels are not biographical history, but rather mere plagiarised fiction, we free ourselves from the dogmatic post-30 common era benchmark for any document that mentions a Jesus. With this new freedom of holistic interrogation in place, we can proceed to interrogate the dubious Christian bias dating of other early manuscripts. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians only seven of the letters attributed to a writer named Paul in the New Testament canon are considered to be authentic. The remainder are viewed by scholars as pseudo, written at much later dates by authors purporting to be the Paul character. The seven letters considered to be authentic are Galatians, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Romans, Philippians and Philemon. They are all dated to between 48 and 62 common era. This dating is of course required for the canonical Jesus story to be held as biographical. The dating logic here is, the writer speaks of a crucified Jesus, which must therefore date the letters as post-30 common era. And he talks of the temple in Jerusalem as active, which must date the letters as pre-70. But we have already seen courtesy of the content of the epistle of Barnabas, that the canonical Jesus story is not biographical, and there is no content in the seven letters considered authentic from Paul that can be used as data to confirm that they were written in the 50s common era. Nor should we assume they were, given that the canonical Jesus can be shown to be fiction. There is only one piece of datum in all seven letters that can be used as a dating item. It is in 2 Corinthians at 11.32-33. to The translation from the Codex Sinaiticus manuscript is In Damascus, the governor under Aretas the king guarded the city of the Damascenes, that he might apprehend me, and through a window, I was let down in a basket, through the wall, and escaped his hands. This is the only reference to a verifiable historical character in all seven letters, and the only available date stamp. Paul writes about an event that happened to him in a precise location, the city of Damascus. From this, we know that the event happened in the city, and some time later Paul writes about the event. But in his written account, he qualifies when the event happened. It happened during the reign of a king Aratus over Damascus. We know from Paul's letter to the Galatians that Paul initiates his preaching career while in Damascus. We also know that there are at least 17 years, and probably not much longer, between starting his preaching and writing his last letter. His evangelising activities in history therefore last for a little more than 17 years, and the start coincides with the reign of a certain King Aratus in the city of Damascus. The king mentioned, Aratus, would have been a king of the Nabataeans. There are only two possibilities here, King Aratus III from 87 to 62 BCE, or King Aratus IV from 9 BCE to 40 CE. The first issue to note is that the idea of Paul referring to King Aratus III is summarily dismissed by scholars. The view is taken that Paul must be talking about King Aratus IV. This conclusion once again follows the untenable deduction process of the writer mentions a Jesus that has been crucified and must therefore be writing post-30 common era, which leads to the King Aratus must therefore be Aratus IV, regardless of whether Aratus IV had dominion over Damascus or not. The concept that the 30 common era Jesus crucifixion story could be wholly fiction is not considered in this approach, and this is the flaw. The written narrative of Paul should be evaluated without any regard to the content of the Gospels. The Nabataeans did hold sovereignty over Damascus under Aratus III 
from 87 BCE to 72 BCE. In 72 BCE, the city was attacked by King Tigranes of the Armenians, and the city came under Armenian rule. The Nabataeans, still ruled by Aratus III, retreated back from Damascus and remained in control of their own Nabataean kingdom in Arabia. In 64 BCE, the Romans under Pompey invaded Damascus and it came under direct Roman rule. With this, Damascus became part of the Roman province of Syria. It stayed under Roman rule until it fell to the Persians in the year 610. During the reign of Aratus IV from 9 BCE to 40 CE, the Nabataean kingdom in Arabia did not include Damascus. In this period, Damascus was in the Roman province of Syria. So the problem with Paul's statement for a historical canonical style Jesus is clear to see. Reisner highlights suggestions that have been made to overcome this dating conundrum, such as Caligula, emperor from 37 to 41, transferred rule of Damascus to the Nabataean king Aratus IV for a short while, and the Roman ethnarch of the city was responsible to the Nabataean king for consular and trade matters, but he was the ethnarch for the Romans, not the Nabataeans. Reisner rejects these proposals and gives good logical backup to his rejection. Reisner states, The history of scholarship makes it clear, however, that the main reason for assuming renewed Nabataean sovereignty over Damascus after its inclusion in the Roman province of Syria in the year 66 was not actually evidence from outside the New Testament, but rather a certain understanding of 2 Corinthians 11 verse 32. Or in other words, Reisner is stating that there is no extant documentation in existence to support the claim that Damascus was ruled by the Nabataeans during the reign of King Aratus IV. And Reisner is correct, that is the case. Arbitrary control of Damascus is allocated to Aratus IV on the basis of zero documented evidence and in the face of actual evidence to the contrary, in order to explain the comments by Paul in 2 Corinthians 11.32-33 in line with the concept of the Gospels being biographical. This is not scholarship. This is peer pressure, coercion and the desperation of necessity. It is purely the existence of Paul's comment and how it conflicts with the canonical Jesus story which has led scholars to make these unfounded claims, or more accurately expressed as invent these claims. The extant evidence against Paul referring to Eratus IV is clear. We know that Eratus IV was an adversary of Herod Antipas and of the Roman Empire in general during the time frame scholars attribute to Paul's escape from Damascus episode. Josephus, Antiquities of the Jews, Book 18, 109 to 142. From circa 33 to 36, there were tensions between Antipas and Aratus over the borders between Perea and Nabataea. Prior to 36, Antipas exasperated these tensions by divorcing his wife who happened to be Aratus's daughter. Enraged by this slight, Aratus attacked and defeated Antipas's army. Antipas petitioned his Roman ally, Tiberius, for military assistance. Tiberius ordered the governor of Syria to march south and attack Aratus. The Roman army reached Jerusalem in 37 common era, ready for the attack, but then received the news of the death of Tiberius. The attack itself, therefore, did not take place. Aratus IV died in early 40 Common Era, a mere three years later, during the reign of Caligula. It therefore follows that the Romans would not possibly consent to having an adversary's armed forces subcontracted in to guard a Roman-controlled city. The idea is preposterous. These facts, relayed to us via Josephus, exclude Aratus IV as the Aratus referenced by Paul. But, viewing Paul's comments against the documented control of Damascus by Aratus III, who did control the city until 72 BCE, it is clear to see that Paul's escape from Damascus should be dated as 72 BCE at the latest.
leading to the correct realisation that Paul's letters are written during the 50s BCE, not the 50s CE. We can see that the Epistle of Barnabas confirms the worship of a dying and rising demigod named Jesus as early as 19 BCE. This fact helps support the statement that Paul's letters date to the 50s BCE. Paul and the author of Barnabas do not necessarily worship the same version of a Jesus demigod. They more likely worship different versions from a body of assorted localised versions. Our last document for dating analysis is the first epistle of Clement. From the opening of this epistle we can deduce correctly that a community existed in Rome at the time of writing who worshipped a demigod they called Jesus. This community is communicating with the church group they know exists in Corinth who also worship the same version of a demigod called Jesus. We can also deduce from the text that both communities know the author of the seven authenticated letters of Paul. This creates an immediate issue with the current consensus dating for the epistle of 96 Common Era. But again, as we have seen before, this is a Christian bias dating born from necessity, not from honest, unbiased secular scholarship. As with the Epistle of Barnabas and the Seven Letters of Paul, this epistle contains no information that can be used to verify its required Christian-appointed date of origin. Leading on from the conclusions on the dating of Barnabas and the works of Paul, the origin for this epistle cannot possibly be 96 Common Era, since the epistle states that Paul is of their generation and has recently died. This immediately places the epistle's origin to the latter part of the 1st century BCE, right off of the bat. But to complement this information and counter the consensus dating, there are more statements within the text, and content absent from the text, which clearly indicate an origin before the creation of the post-70 Common Era Gospels, and indeed before the 70 Common Era destruction of the Temple event itself. These items collectively demonstrate that the epistle is pre-66 at the latest, and could not possibly date to as late as 96. It is the comment on Paul's recent death which moves the clear indication of pre-66 Common Era to being some considerable time before. The first and most telling item is, as with Barnabas and Paul, the total absence of any Gospel Jesus content. There are many places in the epistle where the author quotes scripture to make a theological point. The points being made positively scream out for a quote from the Gospels, but as with Barnabas, all the illustrative quotes are taken from Old Testament scripture. This indicates a pre-70 common era dating. The second point to note is the positive present tense references to the activities of the temple in Jerusalem. If the author were to be writing from Rome in 96 Common Era, he would know the temple and Jerusalem no longer exist. Since he does not know this, nor is he aware of any hostilities between Judea and Rome, he is writing pre-66. Point three to note, the author states that the envoys of the letter are in old age and have been with the group since youth. This creates a certain minimum time span before 66 for the longevity of the group. This implied time span for the existence of the group prior to writing, and therefore prior to 66, would take the group's existence in Rome to a time before the Gospel crucifixion scene. This point alone demonstrates the plagiarised and fictional nature of the Jesus character in the Gospels. And lastly, the reference to the recent death of Paul circa 50 to 20 BCE helps to conclude the dating of the origin of the epistle. It was written in the closing decades of the 1st century BCE. To conclude this presentation, there were multiple Christologies worshipping the death and resurrection of a saviour demigod called Jesus all over the area of the eastern Mediterranean during the majority of the 1st century BCE. This is confirmed by the content of Paul's seven authenticated letters, the Epistle of Barnabas and the First Epistle of Clement. Nine documents that have thankfully escaped the 325 to mid-1600s Catholic document destruction process.
the Catholic and Protestant circa 1 to 30 common era version of a Jesus found in the post 70 common era temple destruction period New Testament Gospels is pure fiction, not biographical reportage. This is a satisfactory and reasonable conclusion to accept. We just have to be prepared to, and willing to, entertain the uncomfortable truth that the Jesus in the Gospels is plagiarised fiction of previous and various saviour demigods referred to as Jesus from many Eastern Mediterranean areas. If you would like to review more research presenting the case for pre-existing mythical Christologies and an explanation of the 70-year reverse construction thesis for the Gospel version of a Jesus, it can be found in my book 70, available from Amazon in paperback and ebook format. The links for this can be found in the pinned comments below. All best regards, Mike Lawrence, Notori, actively campaigning against the religious indoctrination of children in schools.